goodness. For he's kept us uh, from the beginning of this year up to now. So it is his grace and we are grateful for that. So wherever you are, just lift up your voice and we're going to thank him together. Father, we thank you. Lord, we are grateful. We appreciate you for your goodness and your mercy. They are new every morning and great is your faithfulness. We are so grateful, Lord. There are not enough words that we can use to express our thanks to you. Father, we are alive because you have sustained us. For we go to bed and wake up because you sustain us. You are our sustainer and we are grateful. Father, we thank you for another opportunity to come and feed at your feet, to come and learn, to come and be encouraged, to come and encourage others to just have a good time in your presence, Lord. We know you have a word for us. We know you have great and mighty plans for us tonight, and we welcome you, Holy Spirit. Have your way among us. Let everything we see and do lift up the name of Jesus, and may our lives be lifted up too that we will go out stronger and wiser to impact our generation for you. We thank you, Lord, because our lives will be transformed by the power of your word and spirit. Thank you for our sisters and others who will be joining us tonight uh, for this meeting. And we give you glory in advance for all that would take place in this place. Blessed be your name, our Father. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. 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 A few uh, people indicated they might be running late. Some people might not be able to be here, but we thank God for those who are coming and those who will even be watching or listening to the recording at a later time. Amen. We're going to go straight into the communion. As we share tonight, whenever we come together, the Bible says, as often as we do this, the breaking of bread in remembrance of Jesus and we want to remember we may not be able to remember everything but every opportunity we get to remember the sacrifice to remember what the breaking of his body means for us as children of God and takes us further even in our relationship with him amen the bible says in the book of first corinthians chapter 11 reading from verse 23 for I received from the Lord that which I also gave unto you. The Lord Jesus on the night he was betrayed took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, this is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup saying, this cup, is the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. For whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. The Amplified Classic Version says that we remember affectionately and what he has done for us, the breaking of his body. The Bible says in the book of 1 Peter that by his stripes, we are healed. We were healed. Some uh, versions have it in uh, where and some have it are, uh, but all that is not something that is yet to be done. It is already done and accomplished by the stripes of Jesus. So when we break this bread, that is one of the things we are remembering and we are enforcing in our own lives, the lives of our loved ones, that the healing that Jesus has already paid for and purchased for us. And this is an opportunity we remember that. We remember that the blood that was shed was for the forgiveness of our sins. Sins past, sins present, sins future have already been paid for. So whenever we fall, we make mistakes, we don't have to beat ourselves down and feel hopeless because the price of the sin has been paid. We can repent ask for forgiveness from the Lord, forgive ourselves and keep moving on and running the race because the price has already been paid. So when we're re tonight, as you eat and you drink, remember that healing 
physical, mental, emotional, spiritual has already been purchased and paid for. And forgiveness for all sins has already been purchased. We're going to break together and we're going to drink together tonight. Amen. Amen. Father, we thank you every time we come, remembering the great sacrifice and the great salvation you purchased for us, our healing, our forgiveness, we enforce in our lives tonight, that no matter what happens, we will receive forgiveness and we will continue running this race. And no matter the kind of ailment that wants to come upon our minds, our bodies, we will shake it off because you have paid the price for our healing and we are holding you. We thank you tonight and we bless your name. In the name of Jesus, amen. 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 I want to welcome Miss Marilise tonight, Miss Mildred. I don't know who is on the iPhone. Please, if you can chat me your name so I can say hello, I can call you by name. That's I would like God. that. Oh, so, glory. Glory. Yeah. Welcome, Miss Glory. Welcome. Thank you. Thank and you. Miss Bernice, Miss Miranda, welcome tonight. It's great to have you. I am Rhoda. Thank you so much. Thank you. Um, I'm down here in Texas. We're having some cold weather. We like it warmer though. <laughs> but we thank God for another opportunity, even virtually, to come and just share. So right now I'm going to turn it over to Miss Mildred. We're going to have a little time of quizzes before we go into our lessons for tonight. Amen. 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 Welcome, everyone. Thank you for joining us tonight. I'm hoping the others will join us as we continue. So just um, as a way of making a meeting a bit interesting, we decided to set up the first few minutes such that we could ask ourselves some questions from the Bible, like mini quizzes, right? And the goal for these mini quizzes is such that we are able to pay attention to minute details when we study the word of God. Last week, last month, right, in the month of January, when we had the meeting, the question I asked was this, that was Paul a murderer or did Paul only approve of murder, murder right? And because the Bible does not say he murdered anybody, but at the end of the quiz, the question, after everybody had answered, we concluded that he was indeed a murderer. Because when you approve of murder, you're, you're, you're participating in murder, right? So that was it for this last month. So this month, I have actually have like five questions, but they are very straightforward. If you know the answer, just indicate. So the first question here is, who was Esther to Mordecai? Or who was Mordecai to Esther? Her uncle, his niece. Okay, another person? Uncle. Uncle, okay. Any other answer? Who was Esther to Mordecai? Right. Okay. You Why would the guide her? Like um her par parents a figure because when she lost her, you know, he took her on. So Right. Okay, let's quickly open to Esther chapter 2. That's where we'll find our answer. Esther 2 verse 7. You can read from the NIV or New King James Version, preferably. <laughs> Monica had a cousin named Hadassah whom he had brought up because she had neither father nor mother. This young woman who was also known as Esther had a lovely figure and was beautiful. Okay. Mordecai had taken her as his own daughter when her father and mother died. Okay, so answer, they were cousins, right? Yeah, because quite often, the reason we're doing this is because quite often when as teachers of the word of God or as disciples of Jesus Christ, it's very important that we don't omit certain details or communicate the wrong details, 
Mm -hmm. Right. So that's why I'm bringing up some of these questions. So we know that there were cousins, cousins, cousins. Now, the second question is, was Akila, Akila, was, was that person a male or a female? Akila. That's A-Q-U-I-L-A. -I, I could spell it out there in the chat. Was Akila a male or a female? Yeah. A female, okay. Does anybody think otherwise? I would say a male because the Bible talks about Aquila and Priscilla that they were a couple. Well, of course, we know that uh, names back then and sometimes even today can be interchanged. But if you just assume that Priscilla, I said assume, <laughs> that Priscilla is a female name, then you will uh, default that Aquila is a male. Mm -hmm. Okay, so let's let's check out Acts chapter eighteen, verse one and two, for the answer. Sister Miranda, I would like you to read it. Acts eighteen, one and two. Acts eighteen, one and two. Okay, I read in Jesus' name. Amen. It says, after these things, Paul Paul departed from Antioch and came to Corinth and found a certain Jew named Aquila, born in Pontus, lately came from Italy with his wife Priscilla. Because, <laughs> because, because that clothing had commanded all Jews to depart from Rome and came on to them. Amen. We could stop there. So we see Aquila was the husband. As a husband. Yes, so it's a male. Okay, so we have that down. Now, who was who was Ruel? Have we ever heard of Ruel? And if so, who was he? I spelled there's a name in the chat. Who was Ruel? Or better still, yes, who was Ruel? And secondly, um, what was the other name that the Bible referred to him as? Bernice and Bernice and Grace, you're quiet. And <laughs> another person, the three of you. We, we um, everyone was guessing what we were thinking with the first two questions. Uh huh. So that's why? Did anybody get it right? Um. So with this question, currently we don't know the answer, but the other questions that you asked, we well, I, I guess what everyone else guessed, like I knew that. Aquila was a male. Okay. Um, and then with Esther and Mordecai, I thought that they were uncle, um, but you said cousins instead. Yes, actually the word. <laughs> okay. Yes. Yeah, so Ruel, who, who was Ruel? Um, Jitro. Did you go for the answer, Sister Mary? No, I remember you told you told us this thing. In <laughs> 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 okay, okay, yes. So Ruel, if you've heard of Jethro, Moses' father-in-law, the first time that the Bible makes mention of him, they refer to him as Ruel, and that is found in Exodus, um, Exodus chapter 2. Exodus chapter 2, verse 18 and verse 20. Those are the first two times that his name was mentioned. So someone can read Exodus 2 from verse 18 to 20, and you'll see his name there, especially in the NIV. You see him mentioned twice. Um, I can read. Sure, go ahead. So I'm reading from the NIV. Verses 18 says, when the girls returned to Ruel, their father, he asked them, why have you returned so early today? They answered, an Egyptian rescued us from the shepherds. He even drew water for us and watered the flock. And where is he? Ruel asked his daughters. Why did you leave him? Invite him to have something to eat. Amen. So as the story continues, Amen. the Bible continually refers to him as Jethro. Amen. So that's that's it for that. And uh, the very last question for the day is, in which language did God or Jesus Christ speak to Paul or Saul when he first appeared to him? Which language? Was it English? Was it French? That's what I mean. Remember Paul's, Saul's encounter in the book of um, Acts chapter nine, 
when um, the Lord appeared to him and he asked him, who are you, Lord, and all of that. So the question is, which language did he communicate, did Jesus Christ communicate to Saul upon that encounter? Not English. <laughs> Pastor, we need a specific language. Was it French or Spanish? No, it wasn't French. It's either, it's either Hebrew or... Um, it's either Hebrew or Greek. Okay. Any anybody thinks otherwise? Um, I will guess Hebrew. Okay. Any other thoughts? Okay. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so I'm going to read to us from Acts chapter 26, right? I'll read from 26, chapter 26, from verse 12 to verse 15, Acts 26, 12 to 15. It says, on one of these journeys, I was going to Damascus with the authority and commission of the chief priests. About noon, King Agrippa as I was on the road, I saw a light from heaven, brighter than the sun, blazing around me and my companions. We all fell to the ground, and I heard a voice saying to me in Aramaic, Aramaic. saying to me in Aramaic, so, so, why do you persecute me? It is hard for you to kick against the gods. Then I asked, who are you, Lord? I'm Jesus, whom you are persecuting? The Lord replied, amen. So, amen. Aramaic, amen. Yes. Okay. So that brings us to the end of questions. <laughs> you know, some footnotes have the Aramaic as Hebrew. Right. It, it is. Right. Okay. Amen. Wow. Thank you. Thank you. That was eye opening. I did not, I knew Jethro. I did not know Royal at all. Yeah. When I learned Jethro's other name. <laughs> yeah. Wait, what did you say? Uh, I didn't need Okay, so real quickly, the first question was, who was Esther to Mordecai or who was Mordecai to Esther? Some people thought cousin, no. Most Esther was thought... Mordecai. Say that again. Esther was Mordecai's niece. Cousin, they were cousins. According to Esther, brother, chapter two. It was his brother's child. Esther chapter two, verse seven, right? Do we read it right? Okay, what did it say? Let me somebody read that. Yeah, just a moment. Let me get my Bible. Esther 2, verse 7. Mordecai had a cousin named Hadassah, whom he had brought up because she had neither father nor mother. This young woman, who was also known as Esther, had a lovely figure and was beautiful. Mordecai had taken her as his own daughter when her father and mother died. Okay, so that they were, um, so Esther's father was Mordecai's uncle, so they were cousins. Okay. But a woman. Huh? Adassa is a woman. Adassa is not a man. No, no, that's not what we're talking about. We're talking about okay. the cousins, the, the relationship as in, okay. um, were they nieces or nephews, aunties and uncle? So yeah, cousin. Then we asked, the second question was, was Aquila a male or female? So we saw from scripture, asked you talk, him, huh? um, you're talking about Priscilla and Aquila? Aquila, we're asking about specifically about Aquila. Was, he, was that a oh, male or a female? It's a man. Right, so okay. we needed scriptural references. So we did um, Acts 18, verse one and two, just so that people okay. have, we pay attention to details, right? When we study the word. And of course, we talked about Ruel. Who was Ruel in scripture? And uh, we know that Ruel is Jethro. He was first introduced in scripture as Ruel in Exodus chapter one, chapter two, verse 18 and verse 20. Jethro is referred to as Ruel, then later on as Jethro. Okay. Right. Yeah. Then don't we remember that name, but that's good. Right. So, and like I mentioned earlier, the goal is such that we pay attention to details and communicate rightly dividing the word of truth. It's a book club and this is how we do Amen. it. Amen. So can you tell me that Esther chapter two, what verse was that you looked at? 
Ruda. Plus seven. Okay. Okay, so I'm done. So I'll hand over okay. back to Ruda. Amen. All right. Amen. Thank you so much for that time. Hopefully you learned something. We got some clarifications. Yep. <laughs> Because most, most of the time, that first question, we always think he's an uncle. I guess just the fact that he raised her makes it easy to think he's an uncle rather than a cousin, but they actually were cousins. Amen. Yeah, it was his uncle's daughter. It says that right there. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. Oh. So tonight, uh, we have a lot to delve into looking uh, at an overview of the book of first Corinthians and then the first five chapters. And uh, we have some wonderful speakers lined up for us to help us in this as we navigate and learn the word of God. So I wanna welcome Sister Glory and Sister Marilis tonight. Thank you for joining us. We are really looking forward to having a great time in God's presence. Uh, Sister Glory is gonna start us off with an overview. And as she just gave her a chance as she, to go over what she got out of it, then we'll throw in our own contributions and then we'll go into the chapters one to five, amen. 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 You can go on ahead, Miss Glory. All right. <clears throat> anyway, hi everybody, my name is Glory. Nice Hello. to meet you here and nice to join this platform. It's um, the honor opportunity is mine to be here to share the overview of First Corinthians that Pastor Major asked me. I was delighted and pleased to do this because actually reading through the book of Corinthians, I actually learned a lot. <laughs> I'm about to be a wife and I read a lot about marriage. So I was like, this was eye opening for me. So I'm really gonna share the little knowledge, you know, that I gained from their personal experience and, you know, things I've taken away and, if I'm wrong, correct me. <laughs> it's a learning process. This is my first time. So, um, so, so like I said earlier, I do the overview of First Corinthians, and I know we um, First Corinthians um, is written by Apostle Paul. He wrote it to the people in Corinthians in Corinth. So Paul was in. If, if you read back in Acts um, eighteen, you know that Paul was a missionary and. He had been in Corinthians, he has been in Corinth for a long time and he had ministered to the people there because he was a missionary. So he ministered to the people in Corinth. He was there for like two to three years. And after he was done doing his missionary work, he left to go, many, to go um, do missionary work elsewhere. Then he had letters coming from Corinth that the people of Corinth were not living, you know, according to what the, they were living, what they used to read what he preached over to them what, why he was over there. So he wrote a letter to them. And it's really, you know, it's really, let me say what he said. The lesson I learned from here is sometimes when you hear that somebody in the family has done something or somebody close to you is misbehaving, sometimes because of anger, before you want to talk to that person, you just go straight to them and you're just yelling. But when you read First Corinthians, you saw that before Paul wanted to start talking to them, he first of all thanked them. He thanked them. And after he thanking them, he started addressing the problems. And then when he addressed the problems, he gave them a solution according to the scripture, according to the word of God. Amen. So he started thanking them. And then he told them, okay, this, what you're doing is not right. And he started with the division in the church. He told them the division in the church because when he left, there were also other preachers that were coming up like um, Apollos and all that. So people were choosing leaders and people were, you know, talking about other people and all that stuff. So he told them, that's not how you live. You know, the center is Jesus Christ. They are all servants working for Jesus Christ. So division in the church, he addressed that and he backed that with scriptures. And after he said that, he spoke about... Um, immorality in the church for example a man was sleeping with a mother-in-law and he addressed all this and they thought it was okay so he told them honor your body your body is a temple worship God with your body 
So he addressed that sex in the church and food that was dedicated to the adults, to the adults. Um, he also addressed that what um, Christians do in public matters, because if those that have not yet been saved or those that are not yet Christians see what Christians are doing, they would think it's okay. So Amen. if you're eating food that has been dedicated to the elders, it's not good because they will copy what you're doing and it's not right. But if you do it when they are not there, then that's is different. That's what I, I took from what I read. And then the next one I read was um, spiritual gift. He spoke about spiritual gift, you know, and then he tied it down to the body. The body has different function. Your hands have a different function from your legs, your eyes, your mouth. So spiritual gift, people have, people have been given the gifts of picking in tongues. People have been given the gift to prophesy. People have been given the gift. But now it's all in the body, the body of Christ. So the body is composed with your hands, with your legs, different gifts to do different things. So he addressed that and he backed it up with scripture. And then the last topic that he addressed was the resurrection of the church. So a lot of Christians in current way, not believing the resurrection, the death of Christ, resurrection and all that. So Paul addressed that again, told them, you know, if Christ is not dead, we are sinners. And if we're sinners, that we've not, when I believe what Christ came for, Christ died for our sins. That means we're still living in the past, we're still sinners. And that's not true. So he addressed that to them. Spoke about the resurrection of Christ, how Christ died for our sins, and you know all that. And then he ended with a final greeting, a salutation to them, in closing of the chapter. So that was the overview that I did. I don't know. I um, I shared the PowerPoint earlier. I don't know if people saw that, but that's. Thank you so much, Sister Glory. <laughs> Amen. 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 Yes, I saw the PowerPoints, but I haven't opened it. I didn't want to get ahead of the game. I will open it after this. Okay. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. Thank you so much for that. You know, I like the fact you brought that, that beginning that, you know, there was a problem to be addressed, but he did not come in shouting. He, he, I like the way he start, starts it. He gives himself this grand intro, introduction. Before, so when he starts addressing the issues, nobody will ask on what authority are you doing this? He comes in and Amen. says, Paul, Paul to be an apostle of Christ Jesus by the will of God, and our brother sustainer. So he was with a brother, but he's telling this, this is me writing and I'm writing on this authority. God called me on this. So I am standing on that call of God to address whatever I'm going to be addressing in this Amen. letter to you. Amen. But then he greets them and encourages them. Thanks. Like Sister Glory said, starting with thanksgiving for their faith and their walk with God before he then delves into all these issues that he had been hearing about and what shouldn't be. So that's that's so wonderful because sometimes, most times we will encounter issues in life and learning how to kind of approach it helps because the way you approach someone, no matter how wrong they may be, can either be a turn off or make them more receptive to what you're about to say. Amen. Amen. The floor is open if you have other things to say before we go looking detailly at the chapters. Amen. Amen. Thank you. Thank you, Sister Glory, for giving us an overview. We're very grateful. You're yes, welcome. I agree with everything you said. Now, I, I just I would like to add to it that yes, you mentioned that Paul had been with the Corinthians. He had been with the Corinthians just So Paul had been with the Corinthians prior to him receiving a letter from, from them concerning the things that were going wrong. So when Paul wrote the letter to the Corinthians, he was very, very aware. He was very, he was familiar with the people. So he knew how to address the people because he had once been with them. According to research, he actually says that he spent 18 months with them prior to leaving and then and, and how do we know that he was there in 1 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 9? 
no, no, not, not that, not First Corinthians chapter five, verse nine. I think in chapter one, it mentions that when I was with you, right? He meant, that's how we get to know that he was with them prior. Then I also understood from First Corinthians chapter five, verse nine, that First Corinthians, the book of First Corinthians is not Paul's first letter to the Corinthians. It's not the first letter, although it says First Corinthians, but it's not his first letter to them. Amen. Amen. We can see that in First Corinthians chapter five, verse nine. It says, "When I wrote to you before, I told you not to associate with people who indulge in sexual sin." Amen. So it's good that we pay attention to that aspect that this is not his first letter to them. He had written to them before. I don't know when specifically. Now, when he did write First Corinthians uh, to uh, First Corinth, the book of First Corinthians to the Corinthians, we are told that the Bishop of Rome invoked First Corinthians as an authoritative letter. He made it an authoritative letter beyond the church, something that society had to adopt. And that was so powerful when I got to understand that because it tells us of how powerful we are as children of God, that there are things that we can decree and things that we can declare even through our writings that can become law in society. So we should never undermine the value that we have as children of God. So that's what became of 1 Corinthians. So it's a powerful letter, something that a, a whole society or nation adopted as law. Um, so what else did I see? Okay, of course, he addressed the many things that you talked about. The only thing that I wanted to bring a bit of correction to is that he was speaking about people sleeping with their stepmother. stepmother. Yes, yeah. Okay, so that's seen in First Corinthians chapter 5, verse 1. It says, I can hardly believe the report about the sexual immorality going on among you something that even pagans don't do. Um, I'm told that a man in your church is living in sin with his stepmother. Amen. So. Wait. Yeah. So um, that's what I'd like to add. That's, what version is that, Dr. Mildred? Because the one she mentioned <laughs> is what King James also have here that says your your father's wife okay that's stepmother it could be because if you go if you look detailly into the scenario it could be maybe it was not their mother per se somebody yeah it's that. right it's your father's yeah your stepmother mm -hmm. yeah so, yeah okay so that's that's it for now for me so i i i want to just a question not so much too too much of a comment but that same chapter five, verse nine, when he wrote that um, we are not to keep company with fornicators. And then verse 11 says, in the last portion of it, it says, not even as much as to eat with them. Suppose we do that now. <laughs> Suppose we actually exercise that. <laughs> That'd be something else. Yes. So <laughs> when I read it the first time, I had to reread it again because it almost seemed like you and I should not associate with those kinds of people. But the understanding I got there is that people are hypocritical in their ways. People who say A and do B, those are the kinds of people, but he wasn't necessarily stopping us from people who are outright lost. But people no. who to proclaim. Right. It wasn't for the lost. It was for the saved people that's in church. Yeah. And act a fool that's still doing that type of stuff. And he said that you do that so that there will be a shame of what they're doing when everybody stops talking to them. Of course, they, they're going to feel some type of way. And that's going to that's supposed to provoke them to stop doing what they're doing and 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 act right. But um, this is something else. And and I wouldn't say I wouldn't do it. I, I truly would do it. It's, it's, I mean, it's a very, it's very tricky because for it's people hard. who do not read the word, they'll start criticizing that, oh, you're a Christian. How come you're isolating you're judging. Yeah. and judging them? You know, <laughs> yeah. It's, and but, like, where, where is the love that you're supposed exactly. to show uh, to this right. person? Because also then they start, you know, 
being like, okay, you're supposed to, the one who falls, restore them in love. How is this love and how are they going to be restored? Are you just pushing them out? So it's like, at what point do you say uh, this person is blatantly living in sin versus they made a mistake and they are repentant? So it's like, there has to be that kind of. Yeah, and that's love though. That's a lot of love. It's like, it's <laughs> like you seeing somebody going over, right? over the precipice and you tell him no don't go there you know you'll fall or you if you go over you'll die or whatever and then they was like whatever i do whatever i want to you don't tell me what to do so what you're going to say then you just back up right and when you when you do this type what paul is saying here i i find that to be love because the person would really check themselves if they truly love god hear you pastor okay yeah. <laughs> when we get to the chapters we'll probably talk a little, a little bit more and if that. i if i can just add a little a little bit because when i actually yes. read first corinthians i actually you know i came to a point where i read on the marriage where it's on the marriage it says that a wife must not separate from her husband but if she does she must remain unmarried or else she reconcile um reconcile with her husband and a husband must not divorce the wife. So I asked myself this question, what about those who have divorced and got to marry to other people? Is that? What, are, are they legally married? Yes, they are. Because back, in, back then, um, in chapter seven is what you're talking about, right? Yeah. Okay, so um, granted, it wasn't God's idea from the very beginning that people should get divorced, but it was granted Moses allowed them to, to do that based on whatever circumstances and situation they were in at the time. If a man is abusing his wife, I'm talking about beating her out the frame like they do um, at times. Um, there's really, the, I, the word gives you separation time but to come back together if, if reconciliation is available, right? So um, while you're separated, both people, both parties should be getting counseling. They should be, you know, um, and hopefully they're both saved that they would see counseling. If the person is, one is unsaved and the person decide that they don't want to be bothered with this, let's say it's a wife that's saved and the husband isn't, and he doesn't want to be, be married, then he, she can release him. The divorce can go forth. And then that's the end of that. But as far as separation is concerned, the whole idea is to separate, get counsel, regroup, and to be together if at all possible. But if they so remarry, what? they remarry. Well, they remarry to each other, but what if it happens they remarry another person? And if they remarry another person, they're still good because you'd have to actually read the scripture properly. The Bible said that you can, you can um, get married to another. It's talking about Christ, right? You, you don't have to stay. I mean, um, I'd have to actually go verse by verse, but if you were to be able to remarry, it is fine. It's absolutely fine, right? Now, take myself, for example. When I, before Christ, I was married. And married for many years, but it's really on paper. Because my husband and I, we separated, gone our ways. But from what I've known, based on what people say, um, that's... You're not supposed to get divorced. I'm not talking about the word. This is how they, you know, things that they teach you. So I didn't pay attention to getting divorced. I never thought that was going to ever happen for me. But when I got saved and I began to read the word, I saw a whole nother light. So the, the, the reason for divorce still stands, especially fornication, um, adultery. That's, that's, a reason for termination of your covenant if you choose to because the person step out so 
when I, um, and I'm going to be quick about it. So when I got ma um, when I got saved, I was feeling guilty because I didn't think that my husband and I were going to reconcile and I wanted out. But when I was reading the word, so I, I just kept asking the Lord, is, can I get divorced and be okay? And I literally, he took me to Corinthians 7 and I dove into it and I saw that it was okay. And, and the Lord confirmed it by this. So when I, before we got the divorce, I needed to get divorced properly. So while he was doing his business, I was doing my business, right? So now both of us are in the wrong. So one day he called me out the blue and he said, um, hi. After years, he called me and, and he said, hi. And I said, oh, hi. He says, I am so sorry. And I, I would love for us to be back together again. Now I'm in the word now. I'm serving God now. So I'm saying reconciliation. This is God. So God allow him to come back into my life. And I told him, okay. But when he came, because I haven't seen him for so many years and we haven't been together, I just wasn't comfortable with him like that, right? So I took him to my pastor and all this, all the good stuff. We, you know, he spoke to us and stuff. So about a month passed before now we even going to look at each other in terms of consummation. This is what God did. God allowed me to go through the consummation. And I was a deliverance minister at my church. One day I went to church. On Tuesday night, came home. He said to me, this was about maybe four months in. He said, Jeho these were his exact words. He said, Jehovah told me to go back to where, to the person that I was with all these years. He already made two babies and everything. And I said, I was kind of hurt. And I said, I know you're not talking about Jehovah El Elyon. Because whatever Jehovah you're talking about, it's not the one that's in the Bible. Those are my words, right? So then he, he said, the Lord tell him, uh, he said, Jehovah tell him to go. So I was hurt. I went in the bathroom and I did like this and I cried because I felt stupid, right? That I brought him back into my life. And now here he comes to tell me this foolishness all over again. But it was God and watch God. So when I finished crying, I didn't want him to see me crying. So I came out the bathroom and washed my face. All that good stuff came out. And I said, okay, here's what we're going to do. It was, a, it was a Tuesday. I said, I'm not going to put you out tonight because I know you don't have any place to go. And he didn't have any family. We were living in New York. I said, I'm not going to put you out tonight, but this is what we're going to do. Tomorrow, you're going to go look for an apartment. And I'm going to help you to find a car because he was nice. He really was a nice man, although he was just silly. But I said, I'm going to look, help you to find a car and you're going to find an apartment. And Friday, when you get paid, I want you out here, out of my place. I don't want you here. And trust me, there's no need for you to call me because we didn't have any children and we didn't have a house or nothing together. So there's no need for you to call me when you walk out the door. And that's exactly what happened. I found a car, blah, blah, blah. He got an apartment. He moved. I never saw him again, right? So now he's gone. So once we consummated the covenant, we came back into a covenant. Covenant. Now he stepped out. So now he committed adultery. You understand? So now I can divorce him. And I divorced him. And God sent me literally sent me a husband that he said, I, the Lord gave him to you and you to her. So now you tell me, can you get married again? That's God. But I had to do it legally by bringing him back because had I not bring him back, I was doing my thing. He did his thing. So when we both decided that we wanted to come back together and made a new covenant that wiped the slate clean and we started over right and so when we did that and he now step out then the covenant was broken on his part and so now the husband i have is 18 years that we're married and god gave him to me and and i to him so 
that's when I know for sure, being a shadow of a doubt, not a, bear with me one moment, please. Yes, yeah, Sister Glory. So if you're not clear, we're going to continue later up, offline to speak more about Yes. It. Yes. So, so her time. Go ahead. No, no, I was telling Hannah, if she's not clear with your explanations, we can talk about it later because Sister Alice needs to present. That's fine. Go ahead. So that's, that's my story. Thank you, Pastor mm -hmm. Jones, for sharing. Really appreciate that. You're welcome. I'm sorry, I had to step out. I had some uh, my little visitors at the door. <laughs> we're gonna welcome Sister Marilise and we're gonna go into the chapters as we share tonight. Welcome Sister Marilise. Amen, thank you so much. Um, before mm -hmm. I start, I just really wanna uh, say thank you to Pastor Mildred for giving me the opportunity to speak and share with you ladies. So, um, and also Glory, thank you for opening up with um, the overview. And so I just wanna say a quick little prayer before we start. Um, Heavenly Father, I, I thank you so much for allowing all of us to join here together. We pray for those that aren't in our presence, Lord God, that may you find them and meet them wherever they are. I pray that may your spirit breathe through this words, Father God, and teach us um, through your wisdom the things that you need us to understand and take from this lesson. We thank you, God. We pray this in your most holy name. Amen. Amen. Okay. So um, yes, like I said, Glory did a really good job just kind of opening up with um, the chapter summary. So I will go more into depth covering um, chapters one through five. So let me share with you all my PowerPoint. Can you guys see this? Yes. 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 Okay. So in first Corinthians, right? The very first verse actually opens up telling us um, Paul's credibility. It says that Paul's credibility came from God. And this is really important to note because everything that Paul said moving forward um, was not from him, but it was from God's wisdom. So we can trust that whatever Paul has to say to the Corinthians, it's actually coming from God. I'm sorry, one second. I have 30 minutes. So I'm just going to set my timer just so I'm respectful of the time. Okay, okay, I'm good. <laughs> and so it's also important to note that um, just like Paul was called, right? He was called to be a pastor. He was called to preach and to share God's words. We all are also called by God. We have a special purpose and plan that God has for each and every one of our lives here. And so why is that important, right? It's important to know what our purpose is so that way we can start to walk according to that purpose. And the way we can know that is by having a relationship with the purpose giver, which is God. And when we have a relationship with God, he can enable us to know these uh, you know, mysteries that he has for us. And so going on to verse uh, two, we as believers have been made pure through the blood of Jesus Christ and set apart for his purpose. And so that's really important for us to know as Christians, because, you know, we did come from a past life of sin. And so now that Christ died for us, we're made clean. And so we can feel like we're truly God's children and his Holy Spirit can live within our clean vessels. And so um, going on to verse four to nine. Uh, shows us some of God's traits as well as the gifts that he has given to us. God is described as many things throughout the Bible, but this specific verse tells us that God is a graceful God. He's abundant. He's generous. He is our Lord. He's our protector and he's faithful. Um, he's given us so many things, right? Some of the things includes riches. We have literally everything we need. We have many spiritual gifts, right? He's given us salvation, the most important gift. And then he's given us gift of speech and knowledge and a lot of other things. So through Christ, we have all things, right? And so that's really important to know because some Christians, they don't understand that we are hearers of Christ, right? Christ said that we are his hearers. And what does what do hearers receive? They receive an inheritance. And because of that, we can freely access these gifts, right? We can call on God for his different traits in different seasons that we're in. And um, in Exodus, right, when God approached Moses, Moses asked God, who will I tell the Egyptians that sent me? And God said, tell them I am who I am. And so I love that because what that means is that God is, I am blank. I am your help. I am your healer. I am whatever you need in whatever situation you go through. And so when we know God's character traits, we can call on him depending on the situations that we face in life. And so moving on, the, the titles are really just going to be pulled from my Bible. So if you feel like those are random, that's where I got the, the titles from. Um, but this is titled A Church Divided by Our Leaders. That's what my Bible had it titled as. And this covers verses 10 to 17. 
The section talks about various divisions that happens within the church amongst believers of Paul and Apollos. And that was the other um, leader within the church at uh, Corinth. Like Glory had did, um, you know, did a good job explaining the overview. So Paul reminds them that we are brothers and sisters and we should have no division amongst us, but instead be perfectly united in mind and thought. And that was pulled from verse, verse 10. Can two walk together unless they agree? The answer, of course, is no. We must work together as Christians, right? We're all one body with many different parts and many different functions. And so we all have one goal, which is to bring glory to our Lord Jesus Christ. I wanted to leave you all with this image, right? Imagine your, your body, right? You have two legs for most of us who are created um, normal, right? Imagine if your left leg woke up today and your right leg and said, well, I'm a different person and I wanna do my own thing. And so you're trying to walk to wherever you're trying to go and your left leg is saying, well, I wanna go left. And your right leg is saying, I wanna go right. What's gonna happen? Your body is going to separate, it's going to pull apart. And so that's exactly what we look like in the body of Christ when we're constantly arguing and having divisions. We are separated and that's we can't do that with the body, right? We have to be one and work together. Yes, I have arms and eyes and they all have different parts to play, but they all add to my physical health as a person. And so we are called to do that in the body of Christ as well. And so moving on, um, this is Christ crucified in God's power and wisdom. This covers verses 18 to 24. Paul says the message of the cross makes no sense to unbelievers, but we that have been saved have eternal life. And we understand that salvation doesn't come from us, but only from God, as well as everything else that we have. This is very important for us to know because it's a building block to how Paul later addresses the church all throughout this letter to the Corinth. So the church divisions come from many people disputing about wisdom, and they were just arguing about a lot of different things, right? They were saying that different leaders were wiser than the other leader, and that if you didn't follow the leader that I like, then you weren't considered wise as well. And again, that sounds really silly, but these were the things going on at that time. But it's really silly because true wisdom only comes from the Holy Spirit. Therefore, no one is truly wise on their own, since it is God's wisdom that those um, various leaders were speaking on. And so think about churches today, right? Think about, for example, different churches might say, well, my church is better because I have the best pastors and the best preachers in the world. And those that go to the other church, they're not as smart or wise as me. And they don't know God as much as me. That's what we look like today when we're constantly fighting over little things that aren't important. Because like I said, right, true wisdom comes from God. And if your pastor has the spirit of the Holy Spirit within them and the other pastor has the Holy Spirit, at the end of the day, they're all saying the same thing because they're speaking not of man, but of God. And so I want to read these few verses that I really love. This is from Isaiah 55 verses eight to nine. I'm going to read it. So it says, for my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are my ways your ways, declares the Lord. As the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways and my thoughts than your thoughts. And then going on to John 14, 26, it says, but the advocate, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, will teach you, will teach you all things and remind you of everything I have said to you. I love this so much because first on the left side in Isaiah, it tells us that the things that these pastors are saying and, you know, preachers, those aren't their thoughts. Those are God's thoughts. These aren't things we can think of in our own um, human strength because we're not that wise. You know, without Christ, we're not that wise. And so the thoughts that we have comes from the Holy Spirit. And in essence, they are God's thoughts. But God is just so graceful, right? He's so gracious to give us the Holy Spirit as an advocate who can interpret and teach us all these things. Um, earlier, we were trying to discern, you know, different things within the Bible. Discernment comes from God's Holy Spirit, and we have him as our advocate. So we can understand God's truth. We can understand everything that God wants us to understand of his words. And so um, the next one, this is still in the same uh, title, but it's covering verse 25 to 30. Paul goes on to say how far superior and high God is from us, that our skills, strengths do not even come close to God's weaknesses, right? So God is just way too strong that it doesn't matter if we were the smartest person. God's weaknesses are way stronger than our strengths. <laughs> so just imagine that for a second, right? We can literally never compare or compete with God. 
And so before we were in Christ, we didn't know much of anything. I at least didn't. I didn't know anything, you know, when it came to wisdom. <laughs> no matter our level of education, our careers, experiences, or anything, we didn't have anything that qualified us to be saved. But out of God's love, he still chose us despite our flaws, our sins, and our weaknesses. And so we have literally nothing to boast because salvation came from Christ and not from us. And so when I think of God's love for me, right, I think of just literally my past life and how God saved me and how God loves me. And then um, I want to read something that David always says. It says, what is mankind that you have, that you're mindful of them, human beings that you care for them. And I love that so much because it shows how, how just, it looks crazy to the world that God loves us so much, right? We're sinners. We knowingly sin against him. We always hurt God, but yet he is so merciful to still love us. So people might look at God and say, God, you're, you're a little weird. Like, why do you keep going back to these people that keep hurting you over and over? And honestly, I can't explain it, but I'm grateful for his grace, right? And so I think about my relationship with Christ and how much he's done for me. And so who we are today is not by our own might, but because of Christ. This is everything. Um, if there's anything we should boast about, it's about him and only him, right? He's done and given us every single thing. Amen. 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 So we're going to move on to chapter two. That was all the first uh, chapter. And so God's wisdom revealed by the Holy by the Spirit. This covers verses one to ten. Paul is seen acknowledging his own weaknesses and fears, testifying that it, it's only by the power of God's spirit that he is able to preach. First of all, I love Paul's humility. I love the fact that although he was this great preacher and everyone looked up to him, you know, literally he had people fighting over how great he and wise he was. But yet here we see a man who's humble, a man who says, you know what? Yes, you might think I'm wise, but I'm weak. I have fears. I'm a human being, but I can speak because of God's spirit. And so we need to acknowledge our weaknesses, right? We need to be humble and know that we don't do these things because we're so great, but because we have Christ that lives within us. Mm -hmm. And Paul says that God's wisdom is a mystery that was hidden from human eyes, but later revealed through the death of Christ, enabling believers to receive the Holy Spirit, which translates and interprets all the things, even the deepest things of God. And so what that means is that it's our duty to search out these mysteries, right? The Bible is so amazing. When you read it, some things are confusing and those are God's hidden messages, right? And so we need to seek those uh, things out. In Proverbs 25 verses two, it tells us it's the glory of God to conceal a matter. To search out a matter is the glory of queens. I'm going to fill in queens there because we're all queens here <laughs> on this call. So it's the glory of us to fill out, you know, to figure out what those mysteries are and how do we figure those things out through the Holy Spirit, right? And we all hopefully have the Holy Spirit within us to interpret these things. And so in 1 Corinthians chapter two verses, uh, 11 to 16, it says, for who knows a person's thoughts except their own spirit within them? In the same way, no one knows the thoughts of God except the spirit of God. What we have received is not the spirit of the world, but the spirit who is from God, so that we may understand what God has freely given us. This is what we speak, not in words thought to us by human wisdom, but in words thought by the, the spirit explaining um, spiritual realities with spiritual with spirit thought words. The person without the spirit does not accept the things that come from the spirit, but of God, but considers them foolishness and cannot understand them because they are discerned only through the spirit. The person with the spirit makes judgment about all things, but such a person is not subject to merely human judgments. For who has known the mind of the Lord as to instruct him? but we have the mind of Christ. We have the mind of Christ. And I love this whole verse, or, you know, a few verses. It just says how much um, we can understand through crisis, sorry, through the Holy Spirit that is the mind of Christ. God gave us this, right? And it says, who can understand the thoughts of a person unless it's that person? And we have God's person within us. So therefore we can understand God's words. And in 14, it says that unbelievers, unfortunately, they cannot understand God's words because they don't have the spirit within them. And so as Christians who have the spirit, it's our duty to also pray for those people who are lost in this world and just living in a life of darkness. 
Um, and so this covers verses 11 to 12 to 16. The spirit of God knows his thoughts, the thoughts of God and was given to us so that we may understand what God has freely given us. We speak accordingly by the spirit's wisdom and under th understand things through his help. Those without the spirit of God cannot seek, speak, nor understand the things of God. Many unbelievers, for example, they live in sin and darkness because of lack of truth and light. And so the way that they get that light and truth is through salvation, which only comes from Jesus Christ. And so again, it's our job to pray and hope that, you know, those people find the light and we got to be the light too in, in that place of darkness, you know, in our jobs and just wherever we go, we have to be God's representation. Amen. That's what we're called ambassador of Christ, right? We represent him wherever we go. And so moving on to chapter three, um, the church and its leaders, this is from verses one to five. Paul is ashamed to find many church members still behaving worldly because there's jealousy in the church, there's quarreling and many types of divisions amongst them. He's confused why the church members are trying to pick sides between him and Apollos when the leaders actually they work hand in hand to do the mission that God has called them to do, right? They're submitted under God's mission. And because of their submission, God was able to make them fruitful. Um, I, I don't know if you all listen to uh, Pastor Michael Todd, but I was watching this video by him years ago, and he does such a good job by talking about submission, right? He defined it as being under the mission. And I really love that analogy, right? It's like being surrendered to someone else's mission. And that means that you, you just go wherever that person takes you. You do whatever that person tells you to do. And that's what Paul and Apollos they were submitted to God and are we submitted to Christ, right? I ask myself that all the time. Am I saying yes to God when he calls me? Um, am I doing the things that God needs me to do? Or am I doing the things that I please to do? And so as believers, right, um, we have to lay a foundation and allow God to build on top of that foundation. He builds whatever pleases him. So that means that we're surrendered to God. We allow him to take us where we, he wants us to go and use us as he sees fit. And so it's important that we're careful not to build what we want on top of that foundation. We can make a lot of things become our idol, you know, career, money, relationships, uh, our children. We can make so many things become our idol. And it's not to say that those things are bad. They're great. In fact, God gave us those things. But when we put it above God, they're considered idols. And so we have to constantly check our hearts and see, are we truly submitted to God? And is he our foundation? Or are we allowing him, sorry, to build on top of our foundation? Or are we doing the things that we choose to do? And so this covers verses 16 and 23. We are God's temple and his spirit dwells within us. Therefore, we have to be careful not to destroy our temple. We are all one body in Christ. So there is so if there's quarreling amongst us, we further divide and destroy God's temple. Our body is God's temple because his spirit lives within us. So we have to be careful how we talk to our brothers and sisters and how, um, you know, we live our lives and just how we, we move about um, as Christians within this world. Paul says that we should not deceive ourselves thinking we are wise according to the world standard because it is considered foolishness in the Lord's eyes. We should no longer boast about human leaders or envy them because we have in part, um, because we have became part of Christ. So guess what? He's given us all those things that each and every one on this call has, right? So we shouldn't look at our neighbors saying, well, that person is, you know, they have blank, whatever that blank is for you. You know, they have a nice job, they have a nice car, or they're so good at singing, they're so good at preaching, they're so good at, I don't know, whatever that blank is, you know, fill it out in your head. <laughs> so we shouldn't compare ourselves. That's what basically Paul is saying, because we have the same spirit that lives within that person. And so having the same spirit um, just means that God has given us the exact same things. Sometimes we as Christians, we have not because we ask not, or sometimes we ask with the wrong, wrong motives. And so James 4, 2 to 3 goes in and really does a good job explaining that. We desire, but we do not have, so we kill. You covet, but you cannot get what you want, so you quarrel and fight. You do not have because you do not ask God. When you ask, you do not receive because you ask with wrong motive, that you may spend what you get on your pleasures, right? Like I said, we're hearers of Christ, and that means that we have every and anything, but God is also smart. Like, he knows our heart, and he checks our hearts. He's not going to give us a million dollars if he knows that we just want to go buy a Ferrari and buy a big house, but we don't want to give to the poor. We don't want to, you know, uh, 
tithes. We don't want to do ministry. God is not going to give us things that we cannot handle or things that we have the wrong motives for. So check your motives, right? What is your motive? And have you been praying for something and you haven't received it, right? And so ask yourself, am I praying for this for selfish gains or is this a benefit others? Usually what God gives us is to use it for others, right? That's why we're a body. We work as one. God is not going to give me a gift that I can't use to serve others. And he's not going to give you a gift that you can't use to serve, you know, those in your community. And so moving on to chapter four, um, the title is the true nature, the nature of true apostleship. It covers verses one to 10. And so Paul tells the congregation to view the leaders as servants of Christ and test their spirit to ensure it is faithful slash alliance with God, all without being judgmental, of course. And so an example I think about, right, is that usually most of us, and I'm guilty of this, right? I run to sometimes different people to ask them for help. For example, if I'm struggling, like, okay, God, should I get this job or that job offer? Instead of me going to God, I might go to my friend. Well, what do you think? You know, go to my mom. What do you think? And so a lot of us do these things, right? We would rather go to people, our pastors even, you know, yes, they're great and they're here to guide and shepherd us, but they don't trump God's words, right? We got to go to God first to hear from God first. And um, a lot of pastors, usually when I hear them, they say, yes, it's good that you listen to me, but make sure you go back to your words and ask God to confirm these things. We have the same spirit that lives within our pastors. And so we also have to do our due diligence and not just depend on someone else's faith to teach us all things, right? We have God and we have to advocate our Holy Spirit to interpret these things for us. So it's, you know, we got to be careful to make sure that who is our, who was our first source? Do we first run to our friends for help and advice, or are we going to God and his words for advice? And so uh, Paul says that it's pointless to compare the leaders against each other, where there's literally no difference since they both preach according to God's spirit. You know, we definitely covered that in the la- latter chap- uh, slides, where again, we all have God's spirit and everything that um, these pastors were saying were coming from the same source. So it was very silly for the church to be arguing about who's greater than the other. The church has become so prideful and conceited, Paul says, thinking that they know it all. Um, If you all read the, I think this is in chapter four, Paul was very sarcastic around this time. It was actually funny. I had to read it in different versions to understand, but, you know, he said many different things. And most importantly, he was just saying that the church has become so prideful overall. They are so proud that they feel lifted and high compared to Paul and Apollo. Like they feel like they're better than everyone else. And sometimes we do get prideful, right? We might think, well, I'm smarter than this person, so I don't have to listen to them. And so it's important that we are constantly checking our hearts, right? Where are we currently? Where's our mental space being? Are we speaking out of pride? Are we not loving because of pride? Like what is pride stopping us from doing that God has asked us to do? Because when we're prideful, it literally prevents us from doing a lot of different things. Amen. And so this covers verses 11 to 21. Paul reminds us of the importance of being humble, no matter the circumstances, whether we got a new job, a new engagement, children, wealth, whatever, we should always remain humble and not become prideful or boastful. You know, true followers of Christ will go through many trials, just like Jesus was persecuted, just like him. We too have to endure through it all. You know, God does not want us to have a bad life. You might think, well, God, I want to have a nice car. I want to have a nice house. Yes, God wants those things for us. But we have to remember that we still have to to remain humble, right? We still have to endure through trials. It's not that he wants us to suffer and just wear sackcloth all day, but it's that he wants us to not let these materialistic things make us prideful and make us lose focus on who our true savior is. And so Matthew 16, 25, for whoever wants to save their life will lose it, but whoever loses their life for me will find it. And so God wants us to literally surrender everything to him, right? Not to hold on to our wealth, not to hold on to our children, not to hold on to the things that we have, but to say, God, you know what? This is all yours and I'm your faithful servant. Use me, send me whatever you want to do. I'm here to say yes. So that's the the, the posture that God wants us to have when he calls us and asks us to do something for him. 
So Paul was one, considered one of the spiritual authorities in the church. And to me, that just showed how important it is to have a spiritual authority in your life. Because you know what Paul did? He corrected the wrongdoings of the church, right? He gave them a good example to imitate. And just like Paul, just like Paul was for the church, who's your spiritual authority? Do you have somebody that you can look up to that you can feel like I can imitate this person and they're a good example, right? Because honestly, we can idolize celebrities and everybody, but are those people good examples for you? And so I also found it really interesting how Paul sent Timothy to go to the church to be his representative to help them. And so I'd like us to ask ourselves, right, are we a good reflection of the leaders we follow? right? Can people look at, because again, we're, we're Christians, right? And Christians means followers of Christ. Can people look at us and say that, hmm, that, that, this lady, they follow Christ, right? Or do we reflect Christ as our follower? I'm sorry, as our leader. And so if we don't, that's really important that we check those areas that stops us from looking like Christ, because that is our main goal, right? To look like him and to follow him and his examples. And so moving on to the last chapter, chapter five, um, so dealing with the case of incense. So this, the, this was pulled from uh, verses one to eight. So Paul was very aware, I know we talked about this already, the sexual immorality, uh, immorality that was going on in the church. And so he warns them to put an end to this by removing the sins from amongst them. He said first, they should pray with this guy and hope that the man, you know, has a change of heart and he repents but if he doesn't he should be removed from the church at first I thought that was very harsh I was like wow like you know again like we talked about we're Christians we're supposed to love and have an open arm but the reason why Paul said remove him from the church was because sin that starts off small eventually spreads and becomes big right if we don't get rid of it completely it's going to grow Think about cancer, for example, when you have, I mean, hopefully, you know, none of us ever have cancer, but for those that do have cancer, the doctors are so quick to remove it as, at its early age, because if they don't remove it, the cancer sits there and it grows. That's exactly how sin spreads amongst us. If we have sin and we say, oh, we're just going to ignore it, that sin, it's not that bad. It's just one woman that he's sleeping with, not a problem. You know, the church back then, they ignored this, this guy's sin. And so because of that, it, it grew and affected, affected, it affected more members. And they started to think sin was considered tolerable, you know, hence why there's arguing, there's division, there's pride, all these things were going on. Sin is literally a ripple effect. It starts small, but it trickles down to the whole community. And so Paul clearly says we have to remove this from amongst us. That's not just a person within the church, but again, who are your friends that you hang around with, right? Are they causing you to sin? Do you hang around somebody that curses so much and you find yourself cursing with them? That is a sin you got to cut off because why? They're going to corrupt you, right? And so it's important that we have this mind. We don't have this mindset that, well, it's not that bad. Everyone else is doing it. Because when we find ourselves thinking like that, right, it's a slippery slope to backslide. It's a slippery slope to going back into our sinful old ways that Jesus didn't waste his blood to save us from, you know? So it's important that we're careful not to allow little sins to grow into bigger sins, right? You tell a little white lie today and you say, well, it's not that bad. Guess what? You become a pathological liar. And it sounds, you know, dramatic, but that's how sin works. It starts small and it grows and spreads out throughout the body. So we need to get rid of sin as soon as we notice it. And so just David, David was a wise man. He always prayed for God to test his heart because sometimes we have hidden sins in our hearts that we maybe ignore, we maybe hide, or we maybe don't know is there. And so praying for these sins allows us to be aware of the things that we need to cut off before it spreads like cancer. And so dealing, this is, uh, covers uh, the last verses, 9 to 13. Paul instructs us not to associate with anyone who claims to be a brother or sister, but is sexually immoral or greedy, an idolater or a slanderer, a drunkard or a swindler, because they will corrupt us. He does not tell us to give up on these people. Of course not. What he's telling us is that those who are trying, we have to still be there as Christians, our brothers and sisters, and support them. But he's speaking of those who knowingly and actively choose to walk in sin. Those people we have nothing to do with, right? We have to get rid of them as believers. We have to stop hanging out with those people that are constantly trying to cause us to sin and cut them off completely, like Paul said. But if you have somebody who, you know, repents and is trying, those aren't people we cut off. And so in Amos 3, 3, it says, do two walk together unless they agree to do so? The answer is no, of course, right? We can't go left and right. You're, you're going to have to go one way. Um, and then so in 1 Corinthians 15, verses 33, 
do not be misled. Bad company corrupts good character. And so this is very true because the people we hang around with, believe it or not, but they start to rub off against us. Um, I heard, I forgot what preacher I was listening to, but they said that it's easier to pull someone, someone down than to pull someone up. So if somebody is down, they can easily pull you down and sin and, and cause you to backslide than for you to lift them up and pull them up to your righteousness, right? You can't say, well, I'm so righteous and I'm going to hang out with sinners because guess what? You're going to start to walk according to the path of sinners. And so it's important that we're not, it says, do not be misled, right? Do not deceive yourselves. That good, bad company is going to save your good character. It's going to corrupt it as a matter of fact. And so I just want to leave you all with this, right? As a believer, what role do you play in the body of Christ? And are you actively fulfilling that role? Because like Paul wanted to emphasize to the, the uh, Christians in Corinth, in Corinth, right? There should be no division amongst us. There shouldn't be, this church is better. I'm smarter. I'm wiser. There shouldn't be pride. There shouldn't be any of these things because we all have the same Holy Spirit that lives within us. And because of that, we need to work together, together as one body to fulfill God's plans and purposes you know so are you actively fulfilling those things and if not ask god how he can use you to do those things um thank you so much for your time thank you sister molly god bless you amen. that was amen. A wonderful wonderful to reveal amen amen amen, amen. thank you marlise thank you Marley. that was amazing that was amazing yes amen so Picking up right where you left off at that end, talking about division. You know, this same problem that Paul was addressing in the Corinthian church, we have in the church today. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's like all these problems we see in the church today, you might think this is new. It's not really new. It's been there from the beginning and we've been struggling with it and we keep dealing with it. Just remembering that we are part of the same body. Our functions might be different. We might manifest differently, you know, as we continue in the book of Corinthians, like, you know, looking at the gifts of the spirit, the manifestation, everybody's different. We are all still part of that body. Like you were talking about your left leg wanting to walk one way and your right leg. If you woke up today and your little toe hurt, your whole body will know you are in pain. Amen. You can't put on that shoe. You can't walk. It is a little toe seemingly insignificant you don't even remember it most days till that day when it doesn't act right then you will know it is present so same with the body each of us is a temple and together we are the temple so as we go along in our individual life that consciousness of i am the temple of god i have to represent christ but then in community, each of us, when we come together, we are that one temple and Christ wants to see himself reflected in us as a group. Not anybody trying to show up and say, okay, I am the head, so I'm going to take charge over everything because after all, they don't see you, you are not important, I'm the face they see, I'm the mouth they hear. And uh, I don't know what your function is. Maybe you are just in a closet somewhere praying for the power of God to move. Nobody might ever know you are doing something back there, but you are important. And we need to constantly remind ourselves because sometimes we are like, I doubt if I really mean anything because you know, nobody is asking me to say anything. Nobody even notices whether I'm in church or not. <laughs> it's like nobody cares. God cares. He knows you are there. And I like that you kept emphasizing that the same spirit, it is the same Holy Spirit in each and every one of us. The same yeah. way he, he gives the gifts as he pleases, but it is the same Holy Spirit. That wisdom, that revelation in the book of uh, 1 Corinthians uh, chapter 1, verse 24, it says, but to those whom God has called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ, the power of God and wisdom of God, that power and wisdom, you have it. It doesn't matter what part or function you carry out. You have the power of God and you have the wisdom of God. Just like any other person, you can experience it to whatever level you desire. You talked about searching it out, searching out those mysteries. You can search out the mysteries. You have the Holy Spirit in you. You don't have to wait for some prophet to come prophesy it to you. You and the Holy Spirit with the word of God, you can search out Amen. the mysteries. 
and you can get yourself from every lie that the enemy is trying to tell you and get yourself out of every confusion. So this, you know, it just encourages my heart as I'm, you know, just sharing out with each of us. I will be encouraged because sometimes you might feel like, you know, I'm not really doing anything. Look at that. You see, you, you have a book club and you're doing something great for God. I don't even have a clue of what to do. And if I could ever do anything like that, no. You might not do what I am doing or what somebody else is doing, but what God has given you to do, do it to the best yes. of your gift, to the fullest. Like I gave the example of the toe, we don't think too much about it. You just wear a shoe and go. I was seeing somebody, I'm in healthcare, and I was seeing somebody who lost a toe. And because of that, their balance is not the best. They can walk, but they need a lot of supportive shoes. But normally you wouldn't even think that, you know, missing a toe should cause you any problem because after all, you have four more and <laughs> it shouldn't be a big deal, <laughs> but it is a big deal. Yes. <laughs> so Amen. just remember that it doesn't matter how small or insignificant you might think your position in the body is, you are important. There are a lot of our internal organs, we don't see them, but they do a lot. And when something is not right with your liver, for example, your kidneys, we are in big problem. Of course, we never see them. They are not hanging out there for the world to see, but that doesn't diminish their importance or their function. I'm going to open the floor so we can all share. Amen. <laughs> Amen. Thank you so much, Sister Malise. Oh my God, that was powerful. So Amen. powerful. Hope you present again. Yes, I'm going to pick up from the last verses you quoted or the last verse you quoted and I'll uh, give my feedback from chapter one chronologically when you spoke on first corinthians 15 33 i think you used the niv translation which says do not be misled the first time that i really took time to meditate on that particular scripture i meditated from the new king james version which says do not be deceived and that evil company corrupts good habits so and I, you you said something like it's easier to fall than to pull somebody out of a place so what the lord was encouraging me there was that you know when he says do not be deceived sometimes we only look at who can deceive us however he was saying that i can deceive myself so it's yeah. that two things do not deceive yourself do not allow others to deceive you or deceive me because evil company you know sometimes we convince ourselves to hang out with the wrong crowd no, that oh my god, like you said, thinking that we're going to pull them out, but eventually <laughs> they deceive, they 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 conquer somehow. So it's wisdom to stay away from wrong com wrong companionship. Okay, so thought I should just talk about that. Then coming now to chapter one. You know when when I heard that scripture and you know the company thing, the thing that I think about most of the time is somebody who is a believer saying, I'm going to marry this unbeliever because I'm going to change him. Yes. We yes. want to be equally yoked because yes. we just know we are righteous and they just have no option but to come to Christ. I don't know. That's the example that keeps coming to mind. Yes, 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 yes. Very true. That's a powerful example. I mean, there's there's a saying that when two powers meet, the, the weaker one will bow, but I'm telling you, <laughs> it bows <laughs> on condition. <laughs> <laughs> on condition of, uh, based on what you believe it really bows based on condition and this is not to say the power of god is not what it is but the extent to which you believe it that's the extent to which it will work for you but anyway so in chapter one i'm just picking up talking on a few things to that identify to just add to what sister Marie said i got to understand that excuse me um if i lose everybody like my charger is off just a minute okay Please um, pause this. Okay, so I was going to share a few things I saw in chapter one. And uh, that was 1 Corinthians chapter one, verse two and verse four and verse five. You know, quite often prior to the pandemic, most people had known that church is the building. But when the pandemic hit, more and more people got to understand that church you and I are church. Church is a living entity. It's not a, an inanimate object. In verse 2, I'm reading from the New Living Translation. It says in chapter 1, I am writing to God's church in Corinth. 
Then he goes by saying that to you who have been called by God to be his own holy people. Amen. He's writing to God's church. He wasn't writing to the building. He was writing to people. And then he's followed that by saying that to you who have been called by God. And then in verse five, he says, through him, God has enriched your church in every way. God was not enriching a building. He was en in enriching people. So those were two things I picked out in addition to what Sister Malice already said to highlight the fact that church is not a building church. You and I make the church. So typically we should refer to those buildings as fellowship centers. You know, the whole statement of I am going to church is, is spiritually and biblically not correct. If, if you're referring to the building, but if you say you're going to church as in going to meet other believers to fellowship, then you're talking about the right thing because church is um, the people. And when you talk about, um, when, when you look at verse 10, the Bible says that, I appeal to you, dear brothers and sisters, by the authority of our Lord Jesus Christ to live in harmony with each other. Let there be no divisions in the church. Not talking about the building either, talking about people. Let there be no divisions in the church. Rather be of one mind, united in thought and purpose. A building does not have a mind, a thought, or a purpose. Well, it may have a purpose, but not a mind. <laughs> 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 So that's what I saw there. And I was amazed to see verse 24 on a, on a different subject, which says that Christ is the power of God and the wisdom of God. It was so powerful to me to know that Christ is the power of God. So when we talk of God being all powerful, Christ is the foundation of that strength. I mean, it was just, it was a, an eye opener for me. So those are the few things I wanted to highlight from chapter one. Amen. Someone has something else to add there. There's so many things that were those ones are, are the ones that really stood out to me. Amen. Yes, Ms. I wanted to emphasize on the place where uh, Paul was talking about there should be no division among you. When anytime I've been reading First Corinthians chapter one, I don't know what I feel like uh, that's where the spirit of denomination started. If that's what I was feeling. Or any time that I read it, I know there is division among a group of people. But today, the body of Christ is so divided because I'm of Apollos, I'm of Paul, I'm of this, I'm of that. And I pray that we get an understanding that only Jesus was crucified for us so that we try to hold on to all the things that pull us together and forget about our divisions. We just need to forget about some doctrines. I hope if it's possible Amen. for us to forget about some doctrines and just try to be together, try to work together. I'm not forcing us, but uh, that's, that's my hope. That's what I'm thinking. If one day the Lord will make a way for us to live in, in that kind of world. Because other people that don't believe in Jesus do everything together. Yeah. Business. Mm -hmm. they, they do so many things together. But when it comes to we that say we believe in Christ Jesus, it's something else. I hope the Lord mm -hmm. will. Minister to each one of us in his own way. Amen. Depends me for that. Amen. Amen. Wanted to talk about for now. We have to remember also that Paul was speaking to a set of religious people that coming into this new era of Christ and the liberty and freedom and all that. So he he's talking to them over and over and over because he's trying to reiterate what is taking place and for them to change their mind about what they knew. Um, they just knew the law. And so now he's given them something addition. And then for us in this, in this uh, time, we have a lot of religious people as well. And although God has given us the apostles and the prophets and evangelists and so forth, the fivefold for the edifying of the saints, 
till we all come to the unity, uh, come together so that we all speak the same language. We still have that division. And I think that will go on until Christ come because everybody in their own uh, place think that they're right about what they believe. And, you know, one believe that 144 people out of all the billions of people that's on the earth, only 144,000 is going to be saved. And, you know, so, so until we change our minds about what we perceive or what we build upon that was not of God, you will always find that there will be some type of division in the, in the church, unfortunately. Amen. That's true. And that's why the various callings or the various offices are necessary so that everyone should come to the full knowledge of God. But Amen. And until the gospel gets into every part of the world, as in the message of the kingdom, then will Jesus Christ come? Because quite often we wonder why he hasn't come. It's because the message has not yet, the message of the kingdom. So many messages have gone out, but not the message of the kingdom. So until we get there, then he can come. Right. At that point, everybody is at a unleveled ground. There's no favor favoritism. We've received the same message, and now we decide what we want to do with it. Amen. Amen. Then I, have, I want to speak on chapter two. Does anybody want to say anything else? <laughs> I was going to mention excited. Go ahead. with the uh, 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 Miss Coco mentioned about the denominations. I, I don't, maybe just looking back, the people who maybe started them do not come with the intention of necessarily bringing division, but maybe whatever they proclaim, whatever they taught, and the people who received it, what they understood by what they were set, was said to them or what was told them went out propagating because then, like they said, uh, we are of Apollos, we are of Paul, we are of this denomination and we are better than you. I don't think that was really the original idea when they were going out, they probably had the zeal of just spreading this gospel, let, let us build the church of Christ. But then uh, sometimes the way we take things and run with it, uh, the misunderstandings we got and then based on our misunderstanding, we transmitted the message and then the person who received it, received it with their own misunderstanding and things just went wild. <laughs> Amen. Yeah, that's true. When you give the devil a spoon, he takes the entire arm. So that's the whole thing. Yeah. Help us. Yeah. So in chapter two, I think Ms. Malice mentioned this, verse seven, where it says that, no, the wisdom we speak of is the mystery of God. And that's why she quoted, this is the book of Psalms. It is the glory of God to conceal a matter and the glory of kings to search it out. So here it says that we speak of the mysteries of God. And then in chapter four, verse one, it says that this then is how you ought to regard us as servants of Christ and as those entrusted with the mysteries God has revealed to men. So we are carriers of, we ought to be carriers of the mysteries of God. We ought to be carriers of the mysteries of God. And it's impossible for us to communicate the mystery of God when we haven't received, we haven't searched out the matter. Amen. So we are carriers of the mysteries of God, always bringing enlightenment to the people that we speak with. It's easy, anybody, a scholar can read this Bible and interpret it, but the goal, what makes the difference is when we bring out the mysteries, yeah. the, mysteries the hidden secrets of God, unfolding the words so that even the simple understands. Then, let me just make one more point and then I'll, I'll, I'll leave it alone. There's so many things to talk about here. So in, you know, though, so I remember we had sent our questionnaires and some people answered. And one of the things that we stated there was, who is your spiritual authority? And one person responded by saying that God is my spiritual authority. And I, unless you mean something else, but here is something that if I were, when I, when we start having meetings with each person, it's a portion of scripture that I want us to really look at in chapter four, verse, chapter four, verse 14 through 16, it says that I am not writing these things to shame you, but to warn you as my beloved children. For even if you had 10,000 
others to teach you about Christ. You have only one spiritual father, only one spiritual father. For I became your, your father in Christ Jesus when I preached the good news to you. Amen. Urge you to imitate me. Amen. 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 There are so many people we can listen to, but it is That's mandated right. by scripture to have a spiritual father. Amen. Amen. And Amen. It's scripture. You see that Paul was a spiritual father to many people, to Titus, to Timothy, you know, to the other people, Mark. Mark and Silas, I think. So many, he has so many spiritual children, and he referred to them as his children and he as a father to them. So it's important. It's scriptural, it's biblical, it's not some doctrine that someone is coming up with. So this is for those who had those questions and were responding to it and did not have a spiritual father. Think about Paul and how many times he referred to people as my, my, my son, Timothy, and my, my son, Titus, and my son, Onesimus, amen? You know, all those people. I remember when we were doing the book of Philemon, one thing I did mention was the fact that Paul had a relationship with so many people at different levels. When he came to Philemon, he referred to him as his fellow co-worker in the vine. But when he Amen. came to Timothy, my son Timothy, my son Onesimus, you know, so it's, it's a very spiritual thing, very spiritual thing. I thought Amen. I should write it while we are here so that there is no confusion about whether or not you should have a spiritual father or not. You have many mentors, but you need to have somebody like an Elijah, Elisha kind of. Why, why is that important? Part of it is succession, is legacy, passing on the baton. Because when you leave this earth or when you're about mm -hmm. to leave this, you want to pass on something to the next generation. And the next generation may not necessarily be your children, your biological children, but the spirit right. that you have reason, um, you've helped groomed over time and then they carry it on. To, you know, carry on the vision to the next generation and it continues. You don't want your name to be erased, but and for your name not to be erased, it's better you carry Christ as a forefront and you'll forever be. Amen. That's a notion. When you, when you said that, that's honestly what I was thinking about when I wrote that. I literally thought of your question and I phrased it based on um, the questionnaire. <laughs> so I'm glad that you noticed that. Yeah, because that's where I really derived that question from. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> yeah. Welcome. Yeah, because I, I mean, you're exactly right. I think with, you know, the spiritual authority thing, um, like you said, right, I think about, oh, I have mentors and all these people that, um, like, for example, my mom, you know, she gives me good advice, but it's really important to have a spiritual authority. Um, and like you mentioned, Elisha and Elisha, Elisha, where you can have somebody to follow and to imitate and can teach these things that um, you might not know in your own, you know, understanding. Amen. And while we think of spiritual, I'm sorry, Rhoda. Yeah, someone that can hold you accountable and correct you and you should be able to listen to it. yes yeah. accountability is one thing that adults do not like but as a disciple one who is disciplined by christ just like christ was disciplined and was accountable to god the father so too we ought to be accountable to somebody when we do allow ourselves to submit to a person we should it should be no news that a person will make a mistake so the person should not be judged on, oh, they are human and they'll make a mistake. That is a given. They will. So just settle it within you before you submit to anyone. <laughs> just tell yourself that I will be angry on this journey, but I will still be there. It's Amen. A Amen. You'll be angry. You'll be frustrated. You'll be like, how come you don't know this, but I know it. Settle it before you find somebody because you will be disappointed. But it's a blessing to have one. Amen. Amen. I know that for, 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 for sure. And just like we submit to other people and people submit to us, it will be the same thing. People will think of you like, ah, wonderful. But it's okay. It's part of the journey. It keeps us at, this, at the place of humility all the time. Yeah. Say something, say something. Please stay quiet. <laughs> Any comments, Ms. Miranda? <laughs> okay, I'll speak. <laughs> Go ahead. We, we love to hear you. Yeah. Oh, you guys should say something. Sister Miranda, you haven't said anything. I don't know if she's there. <laughs> 
See, that's why you should say something. <laughs> yeah, actually, I was just listening, you know, like um, in the part where um, it did talk about, you know, like um, that in order for two to like work together, they must agree. Like, you know, it's like it's also easy to like say you want to like, um, it's easy to like pull somebody that is up, which is really, really so true from what she did say, right? But it's difficult to like the person that is down to take them back up, but easily they could pull you down. So it did when she said that, um, because I've seen something like that, which is so true. And then the one that she did talk, like there's a case of this, um, like an unbeliever, like yoking with um with a believer, right? Let's say um I was just, I was thinking when they were talking about the issue of, of marriage, you know, it's like, let's say you like um, probably, um, because I've learned something, four stages on this platform, you know, like the way you are, where you receive, like the stage of is it salvation, transformation, then you have to be like, um, you have to be impact, I'm immediate thoughts of four things like that. So, um, okay, I was like, okay, probably, all along, let's say you're at the stage of that salvation, then you have like, you have like, um, you have your partner, right? And then it's like, um, what you believe is not what he believes. You know, mm -hmm. it's, some, it's so like, um, actually, I don't know, but it's, it's really, really, it's really difficult because now it's like, there's so much going along because the two of you, you must be going this different direction. In the sense that what you are now believing in the Bible, right? Because like previously, you know, at first for me, the way I used to read the Bible, it's like for now, it's different. Thank God for the Holy Spirit. And I now read the understanding of the Holy Spirit. So there are a lot of things that I'm seeing that I was, I did make, it was like a mistake, but now it's like, you have your partner, right? But these things, how do you open up these things to him in the sense that, you know, it's like, to him, it's just like, um, I don't know how to put it, but to him, it's like, um, to him, it's like fun. I don't know what it's, it's like philosophy. The way I put it is like, you know, so now it's like, um, when we're like talking about uh, when the, the part of that, as Paul was saying, trying to like caution Christian in church, how to like, as he said, but now if this is your partner and this is the situation, you know, and he doesn't even want to list it. But you, you have known the truth with the help of the Holy Spirit. So in the case now like this, how do you go about it? Okay, are you done? Yes. Okay. You pray about it, bring it before the Holy Spirit. You know, admit that was a mistake you made at the beginning to get married to an unbeliever, but now you have now believed, and this is where you find yourself. You know, just bring it before him, he's going to help you. I cannot tell you, I can't say that it will happen. You, you, you see a solution overnight. You can receive a solution overnight, but the manifestation of it may take a while because the cooperation of the individual is necessary, very necessary as well. Amen. Throughout my life, before I got married, I had not sincerely seen a successful marriage, but I knew that marriage could be successful. You know, every believer I saw was either with an unbeliever because they all got married as unbelievers and the one person got saved. And I saw the torments that a believer goes through living with an unbeliever. Mm -hmm. And I started told myself that I'll remain single because of this, you know, but God helped me. So I understand the pain because I've, I'm a living witness. I've seen it. I've lived with people like that from my own parents and all of that until they all believed. But it took a while for my dad to catch up or for my mom to catch up with my dad. You know, so I understand. But consistent prayers, bringing it before the Lord, applying what you need to apply based on the instructions you receive. And trust the Holy Spirit. Trust the Holy Spirit. In direction. Don't give up. Amen. One of the things that besides praying, the Bible says you live the life in front of that person to win them as well. Yeah. And so that couple with your prayer definitely will make a change. 
And as long as, as we were talking about marriage, as long as you are willing to remain with that person uh, and, and the person is willing to stay with you, then you just leave them alone. You pray and you believe God and live your life in front of them as such. Um, Abigail and, and Nabal is a good example. Mm -hmm. You know, Nabal just ignorant to everything. He acted fool. But even though Abigail was saved and loved the Lord, she didn't treat him any kind of funny way. She did, you know, she, the Bible say, we live with them according to knowledge, right? Mm -hmm. So you know that the person is unsaved and they don't understand the things of God. Neither are they really trying to, as far as you see, to make a difference or embrace it. You don't frustrate yourself. Right? Because the battle is not yours. Even in that, it's the Lord. So you live the life that you should and you continually pray for them and you let God do what he's going to do. Either he change them or you move them. Simple as that. Amen. Amen. I have a little comment or okay. question. Uh, if the sister that asked the question, if whatever she might be going through or has experienced, can she advise uh, single people, a believer to marry an unbeliever? It's not wise to, mar to marry an unbeliever. And I tell no, you, no, I, I, I cannot advise um, an unbeliever to get married to. So I cannot advise a believer to get married to an unbeliever. <laughs> yeah, for sure. Amen. It's not because the unbeliever's father is the devil. And, yeah, and, and the believer is God. And it's going to be a serious fight in that house yeah. all the time. Exactly. That's what I'm trying to say. Because, you know, it's like you, you, the life that you have, your own life is now different. But, you know, with the, the person, you know, is still like doing the things that the devil is doing. So you are struggling to come out totally, but at the same time, it's like uh, Pastor John says, he's bringing everything of the the devil, you know, the, the, the lives of the devil to add. So it's like, um, yeah, for sure that's true. Okay. Amen. Uh, I just asked for that, even though I know the answer, because after the Lord is done with you, people are going, you are going to disciple others. And they will be telling you, but you went through it. Well, how come you don't want me to go through it? Because you've been there and done that. You've seen what it does. You know, um, the thing about it is if someone is wants to marry an unbeliever and they were counseled against it and they choose to go that route, I've known quite a bit then they go that route. There was a young man and, and his wife, um, the girl, the fiance, they came to us for marriage. They wanted my husband and I to marry them. And we told them, no, one, it's not so much that they were um, unequally yoked, but in terms of she wasn't saved and he wasn't saved, but that wasn't God's will for them too. And so we told them that. Well, the, the young man got really mad, especially with my husband, and he just went slap off. And they went ahead and got married anyway. And now they're divorced. And it's been, what, five years. And when I tell you, he beat the mess out of that girl. He did. And, and even when he did his wrong, and he would, I, he would, I would still talk to him. Um, he would call, and he said, I said, listen, you can't continue doing what you're doing. And then what do you expect for us to say to you? Because we're not going to tell you anything outside of the word. And you're wrong. So um, he, he stopped speaking to my husband because he got, you know, corrected. And like uh, Dr. Mildred saying, a lot of times uh, people don't want the correction. They just want you to say yay and nay, whatever they want to hear. But unequally yoked doesn't always only leave the unbeliever and the um the believer 
it could be that it's not God's will for those two to be together. And that's being unequally yoked as well. So we have to make sure that we hear God and know that this is the will of the Father for your life, for that individual to be who it is. Now, granted, God give us mercy and grace, yes, but we'll find that our struggle don't have to be if we follow his direction and his his ways, excuse me. Can I can I can I say something or can I just ask a question? Well, it's a question. Sure. So um yeah, when I was before meeting Pastor Midget and she did counsel us, um, my fiance and I, and that scripture came up, came up. But before I had actually, you know, spoken to another pastor and that that chapter came up that two cannot be together unless they're equally yoked. And I was like, <clears throat> he actually told me, go read on that and then come back to me. So when I read on that, I was like, okay, it's also in the scripture that if a believer, let's say the man is, is saved or is a Christian and the woman is not saved and they are married, they can be together if the other person can change, right? Are they already married or are they going yeah. to get married? They're already married. Then of course they can be together. They're already married. But See, they're when not they got married, yet. one when they got married, they weren't saved. One got saved and the other one still isn't. So But they're not equally yoked. But that doesn't but they're married. They're still in a covenant. They're still in a covenant. So because they are married, whether they're unequally yoked, when they got married in the beginning, one they weren't saved. It's fine. So now one saved and the other one isn't, it's still fine. Because God will God is able to do the same as he did for that one, he can do for the other. Again. Only if they decide, like the one that's not saved, you know, she'll, oh, you know what? I can't deal with this because all you say is God, 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 and, and just and just blatantly don't want to be bothered and walk out the door. That's fine, too. But if they if the one got saved, the other they can wait on the other one as well. It's OK. Even though they're not equally yoked right now because of their how they're walking, but they still have a covenant. Now we're talking about unequally yoke. You purposely go and marry somebody that you you know that wasn't of God. That's different than when two people that were not saved and now there's one of them got saved. That's still, you know, you're looking at two different unequally yoke right there because they're already in a covenant. Whether they save or not save, their marriage is legal in the eyes of God and eyes of the law. Okay. But Sister Glory, were you done with the question though? Or are you clear? Yeah, I'm clear. Okay, were you thinking that because the person now later believed they should just go their separate ways because they're unequally yoked? Well, I mean, but she, he he still is not a believer and they're married together. So it's like it's like getting married to somebody and saying that, you know, I will change this person. I know you don't change people in a relationship. People, you know, you wait for people to change. You don't change people. So when you say, when when I hear this, unless they are equally yoked, but these ones are married together and they're not. And I haven't seen the change yet. So I, I'm like, when is this change going to come? So. Yeah. Okay. I hear you. Yeah. Covenants. Covenants is what keeps them. Exactly. So covenant now will be a whole new topic. I think exactly. it's the old and it's going to be chaotic. So yeah, I totally, I totally get what she's saying. Yeah, I totally get what you're mm -hmm. saying. But the key is they already have a covenant. Yeah, they already married, and whether or not one was saved or they both unsaved when they got married, and now one of them is saved, bless the Lord. But the other one will come, just hang in and and continue to pray and live. I'll save life in front of that individual and God will do what he's going to do. Now, mm -hmm. the difference between the two is if you were not married to the individual, you know that other person is a riot, but yet you pick them up and you marry them and then complaining later on. That's a big difference. Which than, is exactly what before. I'm saying. They were not, um, that's exactly what I'm saying. Before she, they got married, she was saved and he wasn't saved. Okay. Okay. You just yeah. not get the principle of 1 Corinthians 15, 
she she was living in disobedience that's what it is right yes yeah because she was saved and he and he wasn't saved so they got married regardless so well what she probably did was the scripture said it's better to marry than burn right and a lot of people do that because they their flesh is calling them and instead of acknowledging god in what they're doing because this the voice of the flesh is louder than the voice of god they go ahead and they get married just to satisfy to make it um okay for themselves to do what they want really re the real reason why they got married in the first place was to have legal sex and so they do that and then this way nobody can say anything to them concerning that because guess what we're married you understand but knowing full well when they ventured into the marriage it was not the marriage that they should have done and so now you suffer you understand but they're in a covenant and guess what the, um even though they're not equally yoked and you know the other person is not saved they literally can pray and and wait on the lord for that and again like i said live a life that's conducive for them that person to see change okay to see christ so they can change amen yeah but let's just remind ourselves that life is not a dress rehearsal. If we, if we know that something is wrong, let's avo avoid it. It may seem okay at the moment, but I'm telling you, <laughs> you don't want the consequences of disobedience, please. Amen. Yeah. And we shouldn't live lives so where we're constantly correcting mistakes. Let's just do the right things once and move on. You know that. Amen. Means, amen. And hopefully we can learn from the mistakes of others. Like Miss Coco was mentioning, why would you tell me not to do that when you did it? Well, yeah. this is what I went through and you really don't want to walk through this. You better learn from another person's mistake than trying to go through yours to learn from it because uh, by the grace of God, you will survive, but you might not. Amen. And you know, we can look at um, natural examples, not just marriage. Let's say somebody was a drug addict, right? And you know, that took them years and years. They live on the street, they steal, their teeth fall out their head. They just, their skin break out, just terrible something. But God delivered them. Now you have your, now they have their children coming up. Why would they want that child to experience that kind of foolishness? It's the same way with, and I do know everybody has to get their own testimony, but there are some things that we don't need to experience such as that. If, if we're looking at the drug situation or, you know, anything harsh. Yeah. Yeah. Very interesting. I stay here all night. Yeah. I know, right? Not so very much. It's always enriching and the discussions just get. Yeah, it gets back to the end. What's going on here? Yeah, man. <laughs> I don't want to leave. Yeah. But it comes time to close too. It's always great having everyone. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Pastor Jones, Miss Glory, Miss Marlies, Miss Miranda, Miss Coco, and Dede V's iPad. I don't know who that is, but thank you so much for joining us. Miss Bernice and um, Miss Grace had to leave a little earlier, but we are grateful to God for this wonderful time. Just as we go meditating about, you know, not living in division, but living united because we are all members of one body and we have the same Holy Spirit. Yes. Yep. Each and every one of us. Yes, mm -hmm. ma'am. Please, can I just share the schedule for next week? I forgot to speak with you about it. All right, go Let's ahead. Rather, please. Yes. So that we just place. choose people, those who. Um, okay. Yeah, I did not speak with you about this, but I just wanted us to focus on First Corinthians six to ten. I'm going to we're going to find a spot for this part so that we really have time to talk about it, so we don't okay. overwhelm. You know, so I'm going to keep that out for next month. So please, okay. And we can have two or three people do this. That's fine. I'll leave it to you too. Well, there are five chapters: six, seven, eight, nine, and ten. So, are there any volunteers for next month? We're still in First Corinthians. We'll be looking at chapter six to ten next month. Does okay. anybody? We can do one chapter each. 
I volunteer. For what chapter? Um, six, seven. Okay. Pastor Jones is gonna do chapter six and seven. Any take us for eight, nine or 10? I would love to, but that's the day after my wedding, so sorry. You, you'll be on honeymoon, we understand. In <laughs> Wait, so who's getting married? Sister Glory. Well, praise God. Congratulations. Welcome to the club. <laughs> <laughs> Amen. Amen. All right. I'm going to do chapter eight. Oh, I wanted to do chapter eight. All right, no problem, Miss Coco. <laughs> okay. So, okay, we have chapter nine and ten. So, Rhoda, I say you do that. I can do chapter ten. Is there any take take us for chapter nine? Why are you skipping nine? <laughs> <laughs> I can do nine. Okay, the nine Thank and you. ten. Okay. Okay, perfect. I have it done. All right. Okay. Thank you all so much. I would like us to raise our voice in thanksgiving for this session, and then we're going to pray for Miss Glory um, as she takes this, starts this new season and phase of life coming up shortly. It is great and exciting uh, time of learning and adjustment. But Amen. It can be enjoyable. <laughs> it's going to be okay. So we're going to thank God for this time. And we're going to lift up Miss uh, Glory out to the Lord. Let us pray. Amen. Father, we are grateful for tonight. We thank, thank you. you for being with us, for teaching us from your word. Thank you for, for reminding us about the importance you, of you working as one body and reminding ourselves that we have your spirit living in us and we are important. Yes, no matter what we may be going through or what situation we may find ourselves in, that we are part of your body and that your spirit lives in us. Lord, we are so grateful tonight and we bless your name. We thank you for our sister Glory. Thank you, Lord, for this season of singleness and how you've been with her. And that. even this new door of opportunity and uh, yes. elevation and a new season that she's going into in her life. Father, we lift her up to you. In the that name you would strengthen her heart. Father, you will go before her and you will level every mountain and you will make every crooked path straight, oh God. I pray that this will be a union that will honor you. I thank you, Lord, for all you've been teaching her by your spirit and I thank you for the grace and the ability, Lord, to implement your word when those situations arise in the name of Jesus. I thank, thank you, Father, you. that she will testify of your goodness even in her life and her marriage, and that her marriage will be an example yeah. for others to see what you can do in the lives of those submitted to you. Father, we give you yes. all the glory and honor. We thank you even for the wedding that the planning and everything that will go on, it will be wonderful. The weather will be a great one, just one that will make that day so beautiful mm -hmm. and you that her joy and that of her husband to be will overflow even in that celebration. Thank you, Lord. Of this wonderful union that you have instituted. And we'll be sure to always give you the praise and the glory for your goodness. In the name of Jesus. In the Pastor name John, of... can you please close Amen. us? Glory to God. Hallelujah. Father, in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, we thank you and praise you. For thank all you. that was said and done tonight, we thank you for the questions. We thank you for the answers in the name of Jesus Christ. Mm -hmm. And, oh, God, we just thank you for the prayer that went forth for Sister Gloria and her husband-to-be in the name of Jesus Christ. Mm -hmm. That, Father God, that what you have joined together, no, let no man put asunder. And we thank you, Father, for tonight. We thank you that we can come together in the unity of the faith breaking bread in the name of Jesus Christ yes, of Nazareth, Lord. reasoning together in Jesus' name. Amen. And so, Father, we give you praise, we give you glory and honor, and we bless your holy name for all that was said and done. 
We thank you for opening up our wisdom and understanding and allowing us to meditate on what we have read, what we have heard, and yes. what we understood in Jesus' name. So God, we glorify you as God in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth. Let us leave this place, but not from your presence yes. in Jesus' name. Thank you for Dr. Mildred. Thank you for uh, Sister Rhonda. Thank you, Father God, for each and every person. Thank you for Sister Coco and and thank you for DV iPad and Sister Miranda and Marlicia. And thank you even for myself. Bless your holy name as you cover each and every home represented, every window, every doorway above the property, under the property, and around the property mm. with the blood of Jesus Christ of Nazareth. Thank you, Father, for the angels that you have encamped around and about us to keep us from falling. And we bless your holy name in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Thank you so much, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. To the month of March. Thank you. Thank you, Miss Molly. Thank you. Thank you. See you. What, what day of March is that thing again? I didn't see the date. March that I, 13th. The 13th. Yes. Okay. March. Thank you. Yeah. Same time. Amen. Amen. So let me just. Mm -hmm. Make this very quick. Talk. Okay.